And welcome to the desk of Lady Ada. Hey everybody, happy Sunday to you. I hope you had a great weekend. It's me, Lady Ada. I'm back at my desk. This is it. I'm doing all sorts of engineering, doing a little bit of email, getting ready for the week. With me is Mr. Lady Ada, of course, on Hello. camera control and in the chat. And uh, I want to do a couple of little check-ins. Um, first up, just like let you know what's going on. Um, I'm working on Circuit Playground again. I took a little bit of a break because I had to go back and do all those feather testers. If you guys remember, I had a couple of videos where I was building a lot of feather testers, open OCD, uh, testing on a Raspberry Pi, and we released the Wicked boards. So that was really exciting. Um, and just getting all that ready and done. Also, the feathers with the radios are coming out. And um, on topic with that, you know, I, I have a friend who's uh, testing out the radios for me, doing long range tests with the 433 megahertz radios, which are ISM band in Europe, but are not necessarily ISM band in the US. It depends a little bit about on your use. Um, whether you're doing continuous or small data bursts, if it's automatic or control. It's, it's a little bit complicated with that. And I realized, you know, I should probably go and get my HEM license again um, because I'm doing so much more stuff with radio and I want to do some experimentation. And it's not, I'm not worried about the, you know, FCC getting upset like, hey, I saw that you were testing a 433 megahertz radio and you're not allowed to do that uh, the way you're testing it. But, you know, it's, it's a good idea. You're going to do stuff with radio. I want to do more stuff with RF. And um, I did get my HEM license when I was in high school. Uh, so it expired a couple of years ago, like five years ago, maybe four years ago. And I, I never renewed it. And I didn't even know at the time that you could renew it. I assumed that you had to go take the test again. So, um, yeah, I think I took it when I was like 17 or 18. Anyways, it was a, an IAP event. So I picked up from the local bookstore, I actually went by there, and um, they had a copy of the ARL ham radio license manual for the technician. So when I took it, it was called Tech No Code. Uh, apparently, it's all no code now, which is cool, uh, which means I actually might end up going for a general. They also don't, they don't have novice anymore. And it looks, I remember, I vaguely remember the it was, extra was two different um, licenses, and I think they got squished into one. I think, I remember there was like five. Anyways, there's no novice. Um, the technician actually, it's, you know, if you can read schematics and know a little bit about electronics, you know, voltage and current and power measurements and a little bit about uh, dB measurements, you can probably pass it without that much studying, if any studying, just go through the, um, the question pools that you can check out online. I mean, I'll, I'll show that real fast. Um, but I thought it'd be handy just to get the license manual. I wanted to read through it just to get in a sense, not because I feel like, oh, like I have to memorize every page. You don't really, you only have to pass 70% of the questions or so. But I just want to see like, you know, how do they teach this stuff, which I think is interesting. Um, you know, what has changed in the material? Um, you know, the, again, the, it's, the licenses have changed names a little bit. I wanted to see if the bands that you can use and what you can use them for have changed. Um, it's a fun, easy to read book. I think if anyone out there is interested in getting their uh, technician license, technician license gives you access to like pretty much everything uh, you'd want to do with data on the higher frequency bands, like kind of everything. They, it looks like the, the general and amateur mostly give you access to the uh, lower frequency bands for data. Um, this, the whole book is actually kind of worth it just to get this one really handy diagram. Um, and which also tells you which, which bands you can use for which licensees. Um, but pretty much all the, the six meter and above, which is where the fun part happens, 144 megahertz and uh, uh, 430 and the 70, the 33, mil, uh, 33 centimeter, which is the, the 900 uh, band, and also the 23 centimeter, the 1200 to 1300 megahertz band. Um, that's kind of like what, what the, I personally I think is fun. So you only need a, a technician license. So again, it lasts like 10 years, and um, I checked, and there's a, a license exam happening about every month. So in a couple of weeks, I'm going to go and take that. So that's what I'm kind of reading in my spare time. I should have renewed my license, but I didn't. Don't be like me. Um, but hopefully I'll, I'll go in. Maybe I'll go for a general or something, and uh, I'll renew it, and we'll forget. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that. So I'll be doing that in a couple weeks, kind of reading over this. Other thing that's going on, um, I, I did get the PCBs for Circuit Playground. All the parts came in about two weeks ago, and so I'm getting back into that. I kind of designed a basic sort of jig. This isn't going to be the final test jig. 
but this will kind of get me to the development edition, the developer edition, maybe get a couple hundred of them out. This isn't a fast or very easy to use jig, but basically line up these holes and then you have these little clamps and it, it holds it against, um, the thing is that because it has the, all the pads have these large holes in them, you have to align them a little bit. So yeah, this is not ideal, but I think, I don't know. It'll probably get me through the first couple hundred, you know, if I if I test them or I have someone who's pretty good at, at lining up the parts, test them. But I might make a plastic jig for this as well. But um, so last week we uh, handmade three of these uh, circuit playgrounds. I basically used the same PCBs and the final components that will be used in manufacture, and we hand manufacture using those exact components because in case you got some prototype parts that are different than your production parts, you just want to make sure that your tester and all the footprints and everything match up. And actually, like, out of the three that we made, only one of them worked, which is low. I expected at least two of them to work. And um, I had a lot of trouble fixing them, and that's when I realized, actually, that my PCB mask was not made the way I wanted it to be made. So I thought I'd show that off, because this hap has happened to me once or twice. And um, the PCB house I used knows not to do this, but they did it anyways. So it's something to watch out for. So let's go to um, the micro cam. Okay, so this is the assembled PCB for Circuit Playground, my all-in-one board. It's got the at mega chip, and it's got a light sensor, temperature sensor. Uh, a little piezo gets soldered here. I, um, it's the only piece I forgot to solder. A microphone, uh, switch, two buttons, a triple accel axis accelerometer, micro USB, and capacitive pads on the outside, and then um, battery for if you want to use battery, and then like a 10 neopixels. So it's kind of like an all-in-one super mega party board. And I uh, got some nice silk screen on the back designed by Phil B. These are the, the programming pads. So to, uh, when you program them up, you will connect to these four. This is MISO, mostly S clock and reset. And you go, I, I got these FCC and CE uh, certified. Tells you what chip it is. And this is a developer edition. Again, it, it might change. Uh, the design may change in the future, but um, this is kind of what it is to, for now. And this one works all correctly, every, every part of it is uh, functional, so that's good. But um, the reason my yield was not so hot is because the PCB house deleted or did not uh, put in as much mask as they normally do. So if you look here, like this is my microcontroller pad area. Let me get this even more lit. And it's a little tough to see, but like if you know what to look for, around here, see how it's kind of brownish in the center rather than black? Let's see if I can, if I tilt it, it might even be more noticeable. See, there's like mask. The, the mask is shiny, but in between those pads, there's actually no mask. They deleted the pads between the mask. So, uh, sorry, they deleted the mask between the pads. So between each of these pads and that, and also the um, accelerometer, which is even more frustrating because the accelerometer is, is even, is also 0.5 millimeter pitch. You can see that the little pad, the pads don't have mask between them. Ah, so sad. What, you know, it's a little bit, whoever was doing the, the specification for this, um, when they were defining the designing and, and determining what the mask should look like, they kind of didn't obey my instructions. Um, I don't know if it's because it, it, it's less likely to fail so they wanted it to improve yield, and the, you know, the, the PCB house was a lazy, and so you see that they made the mask much larger around a lot of the pads than necessary, and, and they deleted it between um, pins. This, there is a little bit of mask, but you see it's very skinny, which I kind of don't like. There should be um, much more mask, and like right here, there should be a little bit of mask between this pad and this pad, also got deleted. Um, and in general, like, you see these traces that the mask wasn't as tight as I would like. Compare this to the prototype, which is funny, the prototype house actually did a really great job with the mask. I mean, you can really see it is very tight around each pad and there's definitely blue in between each one. I know that there is some variation with color. The color of the mask actually does make a little bit of a difference. The green has the, the highest um, accuracy. But I've gotten 
a black PCB mask with better um, alignment in, uh, you know, than this. So it's kind of, kind of lame. But it isn't going to stop me from using this first round of PCBs for production. I'm still going to use them. The yield might not be as good. I'm just going to have to live with it. But I don't want to wait another three weeks for PCBs, even though I'm, I'm probably going to email the PCB house and be like, hey, you know, I got 250 of these made. And you did this, and you know you weren't supposed to do this, and I don't know, you thought I wouldn't notice or something, but I noticed, so uh, you got to remake them. But, like, these, I don't, I don't like it. It's, you're more likely to get bridging. Not so good. Anyways, it does happen once in a while. Um, but I did want to just quickly show how to, um, if you're uh, using um, Eagle CAD, you have to also watch out and make sure that your pads get defined with the, the, the mask um, what's the term? There's actually a word for this. Let's see. It's the mask aperture. The mask aperture you can set. So um, it's, it's very nice and aligned. So let's go to CompuCam. Okay, so this is the um, PCB. Oh, can you just go to this computer? Because I, I have to get really close in. So when you look at your Eagle CAD layout, um, be sure to turn on uh, T-stop and B-stop before you send it out, which is a good idea anyways. And if you're using the default DRU, which is here, which is a little bit pickier. So the default DRU, uh, first off, it doesn't tent the VS, which is, you know, whatever. I prefer tent it. But notice that the aperture around each pad is actually quite large. And so it leaves only a very skinny little amount of mask in between them. And if you get to, you know, basically 0.5 millimeter, this is not enough. You need much, you, you need the little amount of mask to be much wider if you want to make sure that your PCB house doesn't delete it. So you'll want to go to masks and then under stop, I tend to use a two, per, a two mil um, max stop, which just shows you this is the aperture, this is the, the values, this is how much space around each pad you want. And see how that, like, you can increase it and, like, check this pad out while I click apply. Oop, click the wrong one. Sorry, uh, four. And then I click apply, and you can watch this. Four, sorry, four is the max you want to change. Gets bigger and smaller. One mil is, I think, a little too small. I mean, you could try to get away with it, but you risk having the mask overlap your pads, which is kind of frustrating. And um, it depends, like, it might be fine for your process. But I like two mil. And this gives you, um, you know, like three or four mils in between each pad, which I think is a good, a good place to go. So just watch out for that for the default. The default DRU or Eagle CAD, I, I noticed I used to use it, and I'd always be like, oh, like my yields weren't so great. Then I shrank the aperture, and like I got fewer bridging because, of course, the, the mask helps prevent bridging because it repels the solder paste. So that's, that's the update. And yeah, I actually have my own DRU that, you, that I even use. It's called the Adafruit DRU. And it also tends to the vias and has, you know, a, a much, the pads can be a little bit skinnier, basically based on what PCB houses they tend to use. It's kind of the minimum for any PCB house. That's my, that's my update, Sunday update. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lady Ada. Yeah. That's a nice desk of Lady Ada update. We're going to keep it short and sweet. Watch for your masks. And uh, we'll have uh, probably pseudo random tomorrow with Colin. And then some desk of Lady Ada this week, some Ask an Engineer, some uh, desk of Tony D, 3D Hangouts, and more. We're broadcasting live on Periscope, Facebook, and Twitch, and YouTube. So all those places. Okay. Okay. Sounds all right. great. All right. Thanks, everybody. It was good checking in. Yeah. More hardware on the way. Get these circuit playgrounds made soon. Okay. Laters. Bye, everybody.